Hey, you can take a seat, and I'm going to invite you to grab your Bible or your Bible app and turn to the Gospel of Matthew chapter 5. Matthew 5 is our text. If you're in the room and you don't have a Bible with you, that's fine. Grab one of the Bibles in the seats around you. Turn to page 962. You will find Matthew chapter 5. You'll be able to follow along with us. And as always, if you are here and you don't have a Bible and you want one, take one. It is our gift to you. That's why they're in the seats, so you can use them. But also, you can take one if you need it. We want everyone to have the Word of God, read the Word of God. If you're joining us online, we want you to have a Bible as well. If you need one, message your, the service host, uh, email the church office. We will get you a Bible. Because we know if you have God's Word and you read God's Word and apply it to your life, then God will change your life. Hey, uh, can I just... Uh, add to the announcements that Pastor Pete made just a little bit ago. Um, next weekend, next Sunday, we are hosting the Faith and Grace Luncheon over at our McCulloch campus at noon. Uh, if you don't know about Faith and Grace, it's the domestic violence shelter locally. We've been partnering with them for uh, several years. I'm on the board, uh, and it's a great ministry to women who are coming out of abuse. And if you uh, believe that is a worthy cause, I would like to buy you lunch next week. Okay, uh, you know, we had, we had a, a breakfast thing this morning. We had about 200 people there uh, for a vision meeting. So uh, I realize that some of you can be bribed and I'm, I'm okay with that. So if, uh, if this is an issue that's near and dear to your heart, if you have come out of abuse, if you've got loved ones and you want to support, and I'm not gonna, you know, pretend that we're not gonna ask you for money because we will, but because, uh, you know, it's to raise support for Faith and Grace and it's a nonprofit and it's operating on, on gifts and donations and working on uh, getting grants and things like that. So uh, that's next week. And, and I mention it to you because they're out in the lobby at a table at the, after the service you can sign up for the, the luncheon. We got room for about 150. Once we get 150, 11 o'clock's out of luck. So um, you guys get first shot at it. If you're joining us online, you can sign up too. Email us, we'll put your name on the list. Love to have you come and be a part and support. If you can't make the luncheon next week, but you still believe in it, you can still support. You can always give it uh, to us and our offerings, just designate it, Faith and Grace. We'll pass it on to them and bless them as well. Hey, so what is a crazy thing that you have done? What is a crazy thing? Something that you did that people said, you're crazy if you do it. In other words, something you did on purpose that either you thought was insane or other people thought that you maybe you'd lost your mind. Don't tell me, but I'm gonna give you about 30 seconds to tell with your neighbor and they gotta tell you something crazy they did. Ready, set, go. What's something crazy you did? Kind of waiting to hear. You guys should be talking about this this week in your life groups. Find out who's been the craziest person because some of you have been really crazy, really nuts. I'm not going to tell you whether it's crazy good, crazy bad, crazy stupid, but you guys can figure that out. All right, so if, if you didn't get your time to share or you couldn't narrow it down to the craziest thing because you got too many, then, you, you know, you've got dinner afterwards. You can talk about it then. So for me, the th crazy things I've done that people have talked about, I've, I've cliff jumped Anybody else done Copper Canyon here? What, there's not that many, really seriously, more of you haven't jumped? I mean, we live on the lake. Come on, I mean, what's, wait, where's, the, where's the fun in that? How about, oh wait, how about bungee jumping? Because I did that too. Oh, okay, there's some bungee, how come there's more people who bungee jumped than cliff jumped on the lake? I, that seems a little crazy to me. All right, I went, I went spelunking with my crazy brother. Anybody else gone wild cave, you know, exploring? Yeah, that's uh, a little bit crazy. My oldest brother thought I was really nuts for that. He goes, he gets hurt everywhere. Why are you going with him? <laughs> but I've also had people tell me I was crazy for going on mission trips to Africa and Asia and Mexico. They, they tried to talk me out of it. Don't go, it's too dangerous. I'm like, have you guys read the Bible? <laughs> Sorry. And then I had people, and this is, this is just fun. Uh, I had people about uh, 11 years ago tell me I was crazy for hiring Jesse as our worship pastor. <laughs> and he's not even here to enjoy me telling that because he's on his 20th anniversary trip with his wife in Hawaii. So, uh, you know, but it kind of worked out. So the Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians said, the message of the cross is foolishness or crazy to those who are perishing. But to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. The message of the cross is crazy to those who are perishing. So maybe you've done some crazy things, but can I just tell you from the world's perspective, following Jesus 
Listening to Jesus, obeying Jesus is definitely one of the crazy things you could do. They don't understand it. They think it's nuts. The things he teaches, it doesn't make any sense. And, and see, this, this is one of the dilemmas as Jesus people. So if you're a Jesus people, if you believe that Jesus is the one and only Son of God and Savior of the world, you believe that Jesus actually died on the cross to pay for your sins and was raised from the dead, and you have made a commitment to follow Jesus with your life, then you have a, a decision to make. Are you going to follow Jesus? Are you going to obey Jesus? Are you going to do the things that Jesus tells you to do? Or are you going to do the world's way of life? Are you going to listen to the world's uh, view of success? Are you going to embrace society's path to happiness? Are you going to buy what the world is selling? Or are you going to follow Jesus as he talks about the good life? In other words, are you going to trust God's crazy plan for the good life? Because following Jesus means we embrace his crazy teachings. Following Jesus means that you embrace your, these crazy teachings of Jesus. And, and here's the thing. If, uh, and if you think I'm a little bit sacrilegious for calling Jesus' teachings crazy, or if you think I'm being irreverent, I can take that because... What is normal to us doesn't make any sense to people who don't know God. Okay, things that we talk about. I'm just going to share some of these ideas because Jesus was always challenging the conventional wisdom of the world. You see, the good life begins with poverty of spirit. We talked about that last week. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And that sounds crazy, but are you going to follow Jesus when he tells you to love your enemies? Love your enemies. Matthew chapter 5, just, you know, same chapter over a few verses, verses 44 and 45, Jesus said, you have heard it said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. That, that's conventional wisdom right there. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you that you may be children of your Father who is in heaven. So, Conventional wisdom says if people want to harm you, if people want to hurt you, if people want to humiliate you, you should attack them. You should defend yourself. You should beat them down. You should win that battle. Jesus said, no, I want you to love them and I want you to bless them and I want you to pray for them. And some of you are like, I'll pray for them. <laughs> yeah, I'll, I'll pray for, you know, a boulder to fall on their head when they're driving the coast highway I'll, you know, pray for their RV to break down in a snowstorm. I'll pray for uh, them to get explosive diarrhea in a traffic jam. Uh, don't tell me you haven't thought about it. So, <laughs> see, we want to take even Jesus' teachings and we want to corrupt them so that we feel better about it. And, and yet he says, no, I want you to embrace this. I actually want you to do good to the people who want to hurt you. That's crazy. So we would do it. Or, or we follow Jesus' you know, crazy teachings when he says, give to prosper. In Luke chapter 6, verse 38, Jesus had the audacity to, to say, give and it will be given to you. For the measure you use, it will be measured to you. You're like, really? He goes, yeah, really. Now, he doesn't promise you that you're gonna, you know, he's gonna be an eternal investment bank for your dollars, but what he's promising you is that he's gonna bless you, and the more that you give, the more you get blessed. You get to determine how much blessing you get, not the type of blessing, but the world, no, they say, no, you work hard, you get this money, you, you save this money, you protect this money, you invest this money so that you and yours can live the good life. And Jesus said, if you wanna live the good life, give it away. In fact, Jesus said, it's more blessed to give than to receive. And if you believe him, you'll be a lot more generous than if you don't. And, and it's a way of us looking at our lives and saying, hey, do I really believe Jesus? Am I going to embrace his crazy teachings? Or am I going to try to bless my life my way, the world's way? Or am I going to do Jesus? So, you know, his crazy teachings, love your enemy, give to prosper. Are, are you going to embrace Jesus' crazy teachings such as serve to be great? Serve to be great. In Matthew chapter 20, Jesus' disciples are fighting with each other, arguing over who's going to be the greatest in the kingdom. 
I mean, they all had designs that Jesus was going to like, you know, establish a physical kingdom, a military kingdom, you know, a government, all this kind of stuff. And so they were jockeying for position. You know, I want to be this. I want to. And, and Jesus said, you guys don't get it. We don't, we don't lord it over others like the Gentiles do. No, if any among you wants to be great, I think some of you know the answer to this. You have to be the servant of everyone. If you want to be great, you have to be the servant of everyone. See, the world doesn't see it that way. The world says if you're great, people will serve you. You'll have all these people around you, and they'll take care of you, and they'll wait on you hand and foot, and you'll boss them around, and you'll be the one calling the shots. And Jesus says, no, if you really want greatness, then you'll be a servant. So does that make sense to you, or is it nuts? You see, are we going to embrace Jesus' crazy teachings? Uh, when he says, blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. That's our verse for today. Matthew 5, 4. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. So it started off with, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. You guys got, are you working on memorizing them? Okay, some of you are. Some of you are like, what? I just challenged last week, memorize all of them. I mean, it's one a week. You can, it's one sentence a week. I think you can do that. Uh, I have confidence in you, even if you don't believe in yourself. But blessed are the mourn. And it sounds just as foolish as the other ideas, doesn't it? I mean, at least the world looks at that and goes, no, I don't want that. See, the path to the good life travels through grief, according to Jesus. So do you believe following Jesus leads to the good life? Four people. Got a room full of people, we got four people. Do you believe that following Jesus is the path to the good life? Okay. If you really believe that, it's easy to say that in church. It's easy to say that when we're gathered here. Uh, but what that means is that you actually believe blessings follow obedience to Jesus. And if you understand that blessings follow obedience to Jesus, then you'll embrace his crazy teachings, including blessed are those that mourn, for they'll be comforted. Now, if you don't yet believe this, if you're just here listening or you said yes, even though you're like, I'm not really sure that applies to my life, uh, look, keep listening because Jesus makes perfect sense in the context of eternity. When you, when you look at this big picture, then it, I think it, it makes sense and you'll go, oh yeah. Now, if you said yes a minute ago and you meant it, even those of you at home, if you said yes to yourself and you meant it, then keep listening because I want to explain the mourning process. The morning process, not your process in the morning when you wake up and you, when you get coffee and go to the bathroom and, you know, whether you eat first before you shower or shower, and the, you know, it's not that. We're talking about mourning as in grief. I'd call it the grieving process, but Jesus didn't say, blessed are those who grieve, for they shall be comforted. He said mourn. Now, honestly, this is like my least favorite beatitude. Can I, can I just... Be honest about that. My, I, I like this one the least because I like being happy. Anybody with me on that? You like being happy? Yeah. See, we like being happy. I like to feel good. Uh, I don't really like the whole grief part. And, and our culture literally wants a happy pill. So they don't ever have to feel pain. They don't ever have to feel bad. And a lot of times we're just as guilty of that. And, and a lot of times we complain to God because we want to be happy and we're not happy. And, and it, which is kind of ironic because Jesus said, did you read what I said? Blessed are those who mourn, for they'll be comforted. The blessed life lies through grief. But our culture just wants a happy pill to magically make everything better, which is why, again, in our rebellion, we consume massive quantities of liquid depressants in order to celebrate. Think about that. Does that make any sense to you? Hey, I want to feel good, so I think I'll depress myself. <laughs> you go, well, that's not the effect. Oh, it is. Well, you're right. It's not, that's not the only effect. It also makes you stupid. So, uh, <laughs> and, and that's not really up for debate. I think we all have, you know, like personal stories of people that we've watched do that. Maybe you yourself have done that. Uh, and, you know, and if that's not enough, we, we, you know, love life so much that we take drugs to try to numb the pain and those end up killing us 
because we want to forget uh, what's around us. So we've got the pills, we've got the drinks, we've got the things that supposedly are gonna make things better, but they all just make things worse. And to go with that, we were all raised on the myth of happily ever after. Weren't we? Right? You know, you got the fairy tales and they all lived happily ever after and then Disney perfected it. You know, they all lived happily ever after. They just never show them after the honeymoon. Um, and they, and then Hallmark comes along and goes, hey, let's move happily ever after for old people. And, uh, and, and well, you know, they, they're selling all this stuff about happily ever after. And we were all raised on that. And Jesus says, No. No, the goal is not happily ever after. The goal is blessed are those who mourn. So what I'd like to do is share with you the, the, the mourning process that leads to and results in incredible blessings. Now, as we get ready to, to share this and the steps that are involved in this, can I just tell you that, that as we started with this, you got to make a decision. Because this is a process, you're either going to buy in and you're going to work, you're going to walk this process, uh, or you're going to reject it outright and go out and say, I'm going to try to do this my own way. So just know that as we walk this, you're going to have to say, yes, I'm going to do this, no, I'm not, because this is the path to the good life. So the mourning process begins when you see your sin. When you see your sin. The Apostle John in his first letter says, if we say we have no sin... We deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. Man, what a... He's writing 2,000 years ago, and he's describing our society today, isn't he? Oh, yeah, that's not sin. That, yeah, you used to call that sin, but you guys are the ones who are sinners. Now it's all good. And so we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. Can I just tell you that the path to the good life starts by telling yourself the truth? Tell yourself the truth. Stop playing the denial game. Stop pretending that you're better than you are. Stop acting like you have it all together. Just admit that we're sinners. We're rebels. We're disobedient to God. If you have trouble admitting that, can I encourage you to do some reading in this book? Because Jesus pointed out the sins of those around him. He pointed out our sins, at least my sins. Uh, you know, the Apostle Paul summed it up really nicely in Romans 3 when he says, hey, by the way, no one is righteous, not even one of us. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. So that all means all. So, uh, you know, that's, that's the reality. Now, this was easier. This concept was easier uh, when our culture actually agreed on right and wrong. A lot of you are old enough to remember those days. Now, it didn't mean that anybody actually obeyed God any better than they do today. It's just that we all agreed this was right, this was wrong. And uh, now uh, things are a lot more, you know, fluid, shall we say, because we can't even agree on the definition of words that we all thought were settled. <laughs> but here's, here's the reality. If we want God's blessings, we have to acknowledge our own sin. This isn't about what they are doing. This isn't about what anybody else is doing. This is about what I am doing, what you are doing with this reality. We have to acknowledge our sin. That's, that's why it's so easy and honest for me to say, I am a scum-sucking pig sinner. Now, I know some of you think that's funny, and some people, I've actually, people said, you don't take it seriously. And I go, what about scum-sucking pig sinner isn't serious? I know how evil I am. And by the way, did you notice that I'm not using that in the past tense, like I was a scum-sucking pig sinner? But Jesus gave me a halo now, and I'm perfect. My wife is sitting right over there, and she would uh, not amen that. So, uh, so here's the thing. I am a sinner in the present right now, and because here, here's the reality. I inhabit this body that is not only tainted by sin, but is addicted to sin. And, and my brain has been flavored by sin and has a flavor, and, and the, there's an evil part of me called the flesh that is still lobbying for self-destruction on a constant basis. It's always lobbying against the will of God and for uh, whatever is going to feel good in that moment. That's why Jesus warned us. He said, hey, if you're going to follow me, you've got to deny yourself. Take up your cross daily and follow me. Denying yourself is, is part of this. And, and so, but we have to begin with honesty. Now, look, I know I'm forgiven. I know I'm redeemed. I know that heaven's where I'm going. I know that God's working in my life, but I am a sinner. So, do you see your sin. 
Not the sin of the person sitting next to you. I know some of you right now are thinking, um, I don't need to see my sin because I'm married. <laughs> that person points it out to me all the time. It's <laughs> not what we're talking about. We're talking about your sin. We're talking about looking in the mirror and identifying your struggles, your faults, your failings. Because if you can't, some of you might want to take an inventory of your sin. I, I think I coined the word sinventory. Just take a sin inventory. Just start going, okay, here's, where I, here's how I fail. And just write them down. I dare you. It might be frightening. Get honest about your unrighteousness. Now, some of you see your sins really, really well. In fact, you, you focus on them too well. It's like you use one of those super makeup magnifying mirrors to focus on your sins. And that's all you see. And I got some good news for you later on. But, uh, but if you want the good life, you have to see your sin and you have to grieve your sin. Grieve your sin. Uh, the Apostle Peter in his first letter said, for you know, you know, he's talking to Christians, he goes, you know it was not with perishable things such as silver or gold that you were redeemed from the empty way of life handed down to you by your forefathers, but with the precious blood of Christ, a lamb without blemish or defect. You know this. You know what it cost Jesus to redeem you, to save you from hell, to give you life eternal. You know this. So have you ever been disciplining your child and then had the, do you know why you were punished question go wrong? It's not a good feeling in that moment, is it? Your, your anger rises because they don't get it. You ask if they're sorry and they're not. There's no remorse. They're only sorry that they got caught. Is that an infuriating moment for anyone else? You know, you're just like, <laughs> I got some testimonies right now. <laughs> see, once we see our sin, we, we need to grieve the reality that Jesus suffered for that sin, that he died for me to rescue me from my own rebellion, that he died for us to pay the penalty that we incurred. So in other words, our guilt, your guilt, my guilt was on Jesus. Our sin uh, he took upon himself. The pain that we deserved, he experienced for us. In other words, I just be real blunt. Jesus suffered for my pride and my selfishness and my greed and my lust and my gluttony. He did that for me. The cost of redemption was high and God paid for your forgiveness with the life of his son. Can I just point out that there's not one of us in this room that would willingly sacrifice our child or a grandchild for a stranger? I mean, you wouldn't even do it for somebody you really liked. It's like, hey, I'll pray for you and come to your funeral, but I'm not giving up my, my baby for you. And Jesus did it when we still hated him. We need to recognize that. We need to see our sin. We need to understand the, the pain that Jesus took on to pay for our sin and grieve the fact that we are the ones that cost him his life. So the morning process, you see your sin, you grieve your sin, and then you confess your sin. You confess your sin. So earlier, you know, we talked about the Apostle John and how he wrote, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. The next verse says, if we confess our sins, God is faithful and righteous and will forgive us our sins and purify us from every unrighteousness, from all of it. God will cleanse us from all unrighteousness if we simply confess. By the way, confession is agreeing with God that what we did was wrong, apologizing and repenting and committing to change. It's us saying, hey, I was going in the wrong direction, God. I recognize that. Now I'm turning around, and I'm now following you instead of following myself. That, that's what confession involves. And, and did you notice the result of confession? God forgives you, and he purifies your life just as if you'd never sinned. He wipes the slate clean. He wipes your soul clean. He wipes you clean. He says, hey, now you're guiltless once again. That is amazing that God would do that. So when we confess our sins, the mercy of God flows into our lives and cleanses us from all our sin. By the way, God forgives you so you can forgive yourself. 
Let me say that again. God forgives you. Do you understand that when you confess your sins, God forgives you? Do you understand that? Some of you are not so enthusiastic about that. I'm, I'm kind of stoked, by the way. But if God forgives you from, from your rebellion, from your defiance, from your uh, just brain-damaged behavior, you can forgive you too. There's some of you that are holding on to uh, the fact that you know God's forgiven you, but you won't forgive yourself, and so you're still uh, punishing yourself for what God has forgiven you. Look, yes, you messed up. Yes, you see your sin. You grieve your sin. You confess your sin. So stop punishing yourself for your sin because Jesus took your punishment on the cross. And, and, and if you're having struggles with that, then uh, there's this wonderful ministry called Celebrate Recovery that meets Monday nights at 6.30 in this room. So uh, you might want to check it out. Look, we all have regrets, but God redeems and he forgives. And he doesn't want us being trapped in guilt and shame. Now, I say that, but, but I also want to tell you that forgiveness doesn't mean our sinful behaviors aren't damaging or have serious consequences. Okay, just because you confess and are forgiven doesn't mean that you get to escape the consequences of your behavior. So, uh, I get to share something with you now that I really wish I didn't get to share with you, but... Uh, uh, but since transparent living is one of our core values here at Calvary, I get to share this. So uh, a week ago, uh, one of our associate worship leaders, Jared Farnes, was arrested. Uh, he was involved in a domestic violence incident with his wife. And, uh, and so the police were involved and he went to jail. And so uh, when I found out about this, I uh, spoke to the leaders and that's kind of one of those uh, immediate termination moments where you just kind of go, hey, I guess he's not gonna um, be working for us anymore, but let's meet with his wife. So we met with his wife, and uh, his wife, Lisette, uh, said uh, that, uh, uh, by the way, she called the police, got them involved. She said this is the first time he's ever done something like this. First time she called the police. Ladies, if you are caught in a place of abuse, take action. Involve the authorities. You wanna, you want your life to change. It's not going to change until you put it in a situation where it needs to change. There's never an excuse for abuse. Never. It's, it's, it's just, there's no exceptions. And so she came to us and she told us this is the first time he'd ever done anything like this. It was out of character. And she asked us to help them save their marriage. So then we met with Jared and uh, he confessed. He repented. He was in tears and uh, he asked for mercy and for us to help them save his marriage. And, and because not only transparent living, but uncomfortable grace is one of our values, he is still an employee of Calvary. Yes. Now, before you cheer, there's, there's more to this. He's not gonna be leading worship on the weekends for uh, six months. Uh, you'll see him around uh, because he's still in our employment, so you may see him behind the scenes helping get prep for worship or tech, or you know, he might be you know, doing some office clerical stuff. He might be pushing a broom. I don't know what he's gonna be doing, but... Uh, uh, he's also under extreme uh, accountability. He's on probation. He's uh, uh, going to get counseling. They're going to get counseling as a couple. Uh, he's immersing himself in Celebrate Recovery, and he's going to be working on the step studies and being there. And, and we are praying that redemption happens in their lives and their marriage is saved and their lives are changed. That's, we've seen it happen so many times. We know it can happen uh, but it's not up to us, it's up to them and the Holy Spirit what he's gonna do in their lives. But I'm, I'm sharing this with you because you're not gonna see Jared and some of you are gonna be going, saying, where's, where's that guy leading worship uh, that, that we see a lot? I want you to know where he is because you are gonna see him, he is around and we believe that God's gonna redeem their lives. But uh, I wanted you to know because again, transparent living and because we live in Havasu, everybody knows everything anyway. And I want you to hear it from me first. Probably half of you already heard. So, uh, but that's what we're doing because we believe in confession of sin and how God can restore. And again, let me just say, uh, it, the irony that we're announcing a luncheon for domestic violence shelter here in town coincides with me announcing that we had a staff member arrested for domestic violence is not lost. It's the world we live in. And I've said so many times, if you're afraid to confess because you're afraid that other people find out how messed up you are, we already know how messed up you are because we're messed up. 
I hate to be validated in this way, but it's reality. And if you're a family that's struggling with these issues or other issues, if you're trying to hide your addiction, your adultery, your abuse, ask for help. Because without confession, you're not going to find the healing that God wants to give in your life. You see, when we confess, then forgiveness flows to us, and that means that God's going to help us build a new life filled with blessings because we've seen our sin, we grieved our sin, and we confessed our sin. And now that we've confessed, God goes, okay, now you're being honest and you're admitting it. Now we can start healing your life. And see, this is what redemption looks like. This is the journey that gets you there. This is why you're blessed when you mourn, because you see, you grieve, you confess. And when you do all those things, then you can rejoice in forgiveness of sin. You know why we're not afraid of sharing our stories of life change that include massive embarrassments in the past? It's because we've confessed. And we can rejoice in the forgiveness of sins. See, this is where the mourning process leads to. This is why it doesn't make sense to the world. This is why it's so countercultural. This is why Jesus is revolutionary. He says, look, if you'll get honest about your shortcomings, if you'll get honest about your faults and your failings, then the forgiveness flows. And when you know that you are forgiven and that God has forgiven you, you're not afraid of what other people think. See, that's freedom. And that's rejoicing. And that's saying, hey, I know that before God, I am clean. And we begin in mourning and we end with that comfort and rejoicing because of God's love and mercy are for us every single day. Now, knowing we are sinners that deserve hell, who are forgiven and going to heaven is a great feeling and a cause for celebration. I mean, if you're down right now and you're thinking, I don't don't, don't want to do the mourning thing because I'm already depressed, can I just remind you This one truth to me is revolutionary. We deserve hell. Every one of us deserves hell. And yet because of Jesus, you can go to heaven and nothing can change that because of Jesus. You don't deserve it. I don't deserve it. We don't deserve it. But we get it because of the gift of grace. It's why we can live differently. It's why we can ignore the world's empty promises and we can follow Jesus completely. Now, um, I'm just gonna say that I think a lot of you in this room have made about three quarters of this journey. Okay, you've, you've, you haven't quite made it all the way and you're missing the joy because you're still afraid of discovery. You're like, hey, you know what? I'll confess my sins to God, but I don't wanna admit my failings to anyone else because I'm afraid that people are gonna judge me for it. And you know what? That does happen in churches. It's just not gonna happen in this one. It's not going to happen in this one. James 5.16, the Apostle James says, confess your sins to one another and pray for each other that you may be healed. Confess your sins to one another and pray for each other that you may be healed. If you want to discover healing, if you want to be set free, then there is a part of that confession that is necessary for us to get to the rejoicing part. Because once you confess, you're not worried about what people discover. People say, well, hey, you used to do this. And you go, yeah, I know, I already told everybody. And God forgave me. That's what grace is all about. It's uncomfortable, but we love it. And and you just live in freedom. So look, we're not afraid of your past here at Calvary. Uh, We hope this is obvious after today and the message that we shared. We want you to experience God's grace and we want you to experience the joy of freedom living without guilt or shame. So we embrace transparent living. We embrace comfortable grace as a way of of doing life because it is part of the good life. And again, if you're struggling, Monday night, 6.30 in this room, check out Celebrate Recovery because they will help you work the steps. So this is the path to the good life. This is what Jesus said because he said, blessed are those who mourn for they will be comforted. See your sin, grieve your sin, confess your sin, and celebrate forgiveness. Now, my hope is that today you're living in the joy of forgiveness. But if not, I'm praying you decide to begin the process of mourning because I believe Jesus in his crazy teaching that blessed are those who mourn for they will be comforted. Will you pray with me? 
Father, your word rings true in our hearts and our souls, and it comforts and terrifies us. Because some of us have spent a lifetime avoiding the spotlight. We've spent a lifetime trying to hide our mistakes so that we can look better than we are, and this whole idea of confessing our sins just scares us. So Father, fill us with courage. Fill us with hope. I pray that your spirit would move in this room and in the homes joining us online and would speak powerfully to us and give us the courage to, to walk this process of mourning so that we can live in joy, so that we can discover freedom, so that we can know what it is to be fearless about our past and ourselves because we know your love and your grace for us. Father, that's my prayer for everyone who's listening. It's my prayer that you would just change our attitudes in our hearts because we know the freedom of forgiveness. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.